Proverbs 31, starting at verse 10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are stronger, are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds a distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, as he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Amen. 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 Jesus Christ is the only alternative to death and hell. There is no other. Jesus Christ is the door to heaven. There is no other. He is the way. There is no other way. He is the truth. And in this age of no absolutes, Jesus is the the great absolute, he is the truth. And so people who are continually seeking and never finding, when they find Jesus, they find what they were seeking, the truth. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we are going to talk today actually about prayer, but I just wanted to say those things because we owe Jesus our lives. I think that some people think that they're doing Jesus a favor by saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus. No, he's the one who's done us a favor. And if we say we love God, well, the Bible will tell us if we love God or not. Because if we love God, that means our lives change and we try to please God. Yes. And even in the Old Testament and in the New, both, I have run across these wonderful statements that say, find out how to please God. So is he just not just going to give us a, a brainwave here that this is how to please God? No, it's we find out by the word of God that he has given to us. And we find out all kinds of ways to please God. And it's our duty to find them out. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we come to church and we, we hear a sermon and, and we worship God and that's all good. That's part of finding out how to please God. But there's a greater part, and that's the part we do on our own. Find out how to please God. Okay, so I'm still not to my sermon yet. I want to talk about prayer. You know, there was um, a disciple by the name of James. He was John's brother. They were the sons of thunder, Jesus nicknamed them. And... Um, one day, James was caught in the book of Acts, put in prison, and beheaded. 
And um, then when Peter got caught and put in prison, this was all for preaching in the name of Jesus, you know they had a big prayer meeting for Peter because they expected him to be beheaded as well. So they were praying incessantly without ceasing for Peter. And you remember that an angel came. His chains fell off him. The doors opened. The guards were asleep. And he walked right out into the night air. And he's thinking, this is a dream. Wouldn't you? And then he finds himself standing there and the angel's gone and he's outside the prison. Well, he immediately goes to John Mark's house where he knows there is a prayer meeting going on. His mom has prayer meetings all the time. And he was released from prison because they were praying. Now, you'll notice that James was beheaded. Don't you think they were praying for him there too? Certainly they were. But in this case, you can see the great answer of God in answer to, to the church's prayers here. And also, we need to keep in mind that God has a plan for each one of us. He has a plan for you. He knew your birth date, of course, and he knows your death date. And you will not die before God has, before you have fulfilled God's purpose on this earth. That's a comforting thought, okay? Until you have fulfilled your purpose on it, you're going to live. And if you fulfilled your purpose on earth, certainly you can uh, agree with God's will when it comes your time to go. You have no choice anyway, right? Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit here about prayer being the greatest outlet of power in a Christian's life. And there's only one inlet of power. You can't go plug into any source. You can't plug into the television to get this power. You can't plug into your radio or your cell phone. You can't plug into all kinds of great sermons to listen to. You can't just plug into any source. There's one source of power. And that's the Holy Spirit, and that's prayer. Only in prayer is there power. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if we want more power, then what do we need to do? Yeah, we, we've got to uh, plug in more to that inlet of power to come into our lives. Why do you suppose Jesus told the disciples, go and wait for the promise of the Father? Wait until you're endued with power from on high, and then you'll be my witnesses in all the earth. So there is something very important about it. I think it's, it's important for us to realize that you know they had been with Jesus for three years. Okay? That was their university. Three years with Jesus. They saw all his miracles. They heard all of his teachings. They were being trained by him in private when the crowds weren't around. Jesus was training them. You would think that just seeing him die, seeing him do all the miracles, and now being resurrected from the dead, that that's all they would need to turn the world upside down. But Jesus said, no. It's not just the story that you need. You wait till you're endued with power from on high. And then you will have power to be my witnesses. To the other most parts of the earth. So do you think it's important that Holy Spirit is part of our lives? He's the only inlet of power. He comes in by invitation and consent. He is often in as a guest and not as a host. He can be hindered in his natural movements. He can be tied up so he can't do what he would. Say what? Doesn't God do everything that he wants to do? God decided when he made us to give us that free will, which has caused us a lot of trouble. But he decided to do that because he wanted people of free will to choose to love and serve him. Okay, so even when the Holy Ghost is in us, resides in us, 
He's still not pulling the strings and making you do things. When the priests came to the edge of the Jordan, the word from God was to tell Joshua to tell them they had to put their foot in the water and it would part. Oh my, can you do that? How do you suppose they felt? But they did it, and the water split. Did you know that when the Jordan River split and the Israelites marched across, it was it split 16 miles upriver. It wasn't a single lane path that they crossed the Jordan. It was a wide swath of dry land. They went across. God is big. He's bigger than we think. He's bigger than we understand. Yes, he is. You got problems? He created the world out of nothing. He hung the stars on nothing. He put all these scientific laws into play. He put all the gravity and the uh, orbits. He did that. Besides, he knows all the stars by name. There's stars these scientists that haven't even discovered. God was all by name. He made them one, one by one. He made them. There they are. Light in the night sky. Your problem is too big. The one uh, that came to him, I think it was a leper, came to him and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. You can heal me if you will. And then another one who was sick came to Jesus and said, if you can. And Jesus said, if I can. Be healed. Okay. So, so God doesn't have a disability. He is not limited by anything. He can meet you. He can take care of you. Amen. All right. So this prayer. Now we are not conscious or only partially conscious of His presence many times, but when we yield to the Holy Spirit, to that still small voice that speaks to us. When we yield to that, we cultivate his friendship. You want to be friends with the Holy Spirit, right? Sure you do. We all do. And then we give him permission to have full swing in our lives. And that results in what is called power. So one in another power is the Holy Spirit, not as a resident, but in control. Let's not do this thing of I like God business. Let's do the I love God business and show it in our actions. The Holy Spirit will not make you move. No. But he will direct you as you move. It's the same as you've got to turn that car off when you go out there. The motor's got to be running if you expect to put it in drive and move the thing. But who's got to put it in drive? The car? No. You put it in drive. And you steer the car. Okay, so this power of the Holy Spirit is available to everybody, but we need to utilize it. We need to do something. We need to move a hand, move an arm. Just, okay, you're, you're following where I'm going, I hope. <laughs> All right. So there are five outlets of power. One inlet, the Holy Spirit. Five outlets of power. One, through the life, what we are. If we are right with God, if we love God and we love people, even though we're not conscious of it, there is power going through our lives to other people. We may constantly do more in what we are than in what we do. We may serve better in the lives we live than in the best service that we ever give. The memory of that should bring us rest and we should relax. I think, well, God wants me to do some big important things. The most important thing God wants you and I to be is just to be his follower. To be. That's my life. That's how I treat my family. That's how I get along with people and my friends. That's when I forgive others who have done me wrong. That's when I pray for those who persecute me and bless those who curse me. 
So how can you do that? Well, we, you've got to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit that has come into you when you invited him in. And now you allow him to have control over you. And we have done our business to find out how to please God. Okay. We've got some things to do. We're not puppets. We're not just empty-headed people. We're thinking, rational beings. God made us that way. And he wants us to give the Holy Spirit full control. There's another outlet. Number one, through the life. Number two, through the lips. What we say. Sometimes when we try to talk to somebody about Jesus, we, we might get red in the face a little bit. It, it is a precious thing we're talking about. We're not sure how they're going to receive it. Maybe we're a little hesitant, a little shy. But we say what we can. Maybe the words are stammering. Maybe they're not all just right. And you think, oh, I wish I would have said this. I wish I would have said that. But if we've done our best, God has taken that best like he took the little boy's lunch and prayed over it, blessed it, and broke it to the crowds, to the multitude. Don't worry about how faltering you might be when you're sharing about Jesus Christ or whatever. Just do it. Why? Because you love God and you love people. You love the person you're talking to. Let God take care of the rest. Amen. You know, we're not perfect. We don't always think real good on our feet. I don't. But we do the best we can. Yeah. The Holy Spirit comes back and he, he takes care. All right. The third outlet of power is through our service, and that's what we do. And again, we might not think what we do is perfect and it's not good enough, but it's the best we can do in whatever situation. If it's your best, it will bring a harvest, even though you look at it and wish it had been more perfect. Fourth outlet of power is through our money. Oh, dear. We're in church and we're talking about money. But do you realize that money is your life? How do you get money? Most people work for it. Mm -hmm. So you put in hours of your life every day working and you get paid for that. So the money, the dollars that you have represent hours of your life. And that money is powerful. We know that it's powerful to pay our house payments and our car payments and sometimes some frivolities. Um, but that money, when it has, you have given tithes out of it, the 10% to the Lord, and then the Bible talks often about tithes and offerings. You know, there's people that need, and we talk about it all the time here, and the poor was always on Jesus' mind and on the disciples' mind. That was a, a main thing that the early church did was to take care of the poor. All right, and so there are times when we need to be open-handed with our money. Money can be very powerful uh, to help people and to minister to people. Sometimes it's just a little bit of money because you only got a little bit. Again, uh, you can't give away thousands of dollars. Most of us here can't. But we might be able to give a five or a ten sometimes. And that's all that's expected of us from God is to those little, little things. Well, it wasn't much. But God blesses the little that we can do. <clears throat> However, we've talked about all these different uh, outlets. The greatest outlet is prayer. The power of a life, the life that you live, only touches one spot. You can only be in one spot at a time. Right now we're in church, in Grand View. You can't be at your kid's house right now. You're here. And so our life is limited by space and time. All right, and the power through the lips depends wholly on what? The life the, in the back of it. You know what everybody thinks of people who talk a lot about God and Jesus and live life, you know, <coughs> for themselves. 
And so just talking doesn't always do it. The life has to be back of that. So that, too, is limited. Uh, power through your service or your work might be great and touching many spots, and yet it's always less than the life outlet, your very life. Power through money depends on the motive back of the money. You go back to the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira, and uh, you know, they want to pretend they were giving more than they did. And they were perfectly fine giving whatever portion they wanted to give of the land that they sold, but they wanted to pretend they were giving everything. And so there is sometimes hypocrisy in giving or wrong motives, and then even the money loses its power. So the greatest thing that anyone can do for God and for man is to pray. It's not the only thing, the other things are important, but it is the chief thing. A correct balancing of the possible powers one may exert puts it first, where if a man is to pray right, he must first be right in his motives and life. And if a man be right and put the practice of praying in its right place, then his serving and giving and speaking will be fairly fragrant with the presence of God. So, you say, oh, you're making Christianity way too hard. It's a heavy burden. Let me, let me just go back a little bit to being born again. So before we're born again, we are considered as slaves to sin. Consider the people in Egypt, the Israelites in Egypt. They were whipped, they were forced to do this work, they were beaten, many died in the slave fields and so on, it was bad. Okay, and so we liken the Egypt experience to sin in our lives today. So when we're born again, we are born from sin, we are born into life. And that's why what I'm talking about today is not a burden for those who have been born again into life. So for a person to want to live a selfish, self-centered life, that belongs to the sin life. That belongs to the slavery life of sin. Okay? We don't want to go back there like a pig that gets all washed up nice and clean with a bow tied around it, and the minute he gets out, he's looking for a mud, a mud place. He wants yeah. a mud bath. And so when we're born again, we don't want to go back into the filthiness and rottenness and despairing of the sin life. We want to stay in the born again life with the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. How awesome is that? And these other things are simply allowing the Holy Spirit to give us power to live now this new life. Praise his name. Amen. Now it's a joy. If I have that extra dollar in my wallet, that I might give when I see a need. That's a joy to the born-again person. That's not a burden. Okay? Because... Jesus taught us that money isn't everything. He taught us that money is to be a servant, not a master. Amen. And uh, everything in our lives needs to be second to our devotion to Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the great people of the earth today are the people who pray. But listen to this. Not those who talk about prayer. Not those who say they believe in prayer. Nor yet those who can explain about prayer. But I mean these people who take time and pray. And time for everybody is precious. People who pray make time. They take it from some other very necessary part of their lives. They're determined to make time to pray. Why? Because that's where the power is. I need the edification. Paul talks in, in the Corinthians about uh, being full of the Holy Spirit. He talks about uh, the importance of uh, being immersed in the Holy Spirit. And we find that he is 
jealous for that, meaning he wants that. He is seeking to follow Christ as closely as possible. I, I, uh, I find it frustrating to see people who call themselves Christians who are not at all interested in following Jesus Christ, actually. Hmm. I don't know, they're following some nice idea of something. I don't know, but it's not in the scripture. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Yes, Lord. And then there's uh, places too. You know that we must, uh, Paul says under the inspiration of the Spirit, that we must die with Christ if we want to be resurrected with him. What's that dying all about? It's dying to self. It's putting God first and others second and me third. That's not human nature. That's why we need to be born again. Because we need that new nature that comes from God and that presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. It makes us different people. The Bible says we become a new creature. It is a miracle that takes place. Conversion, born again, getting saved. With those terms are all the same. Born again into his kingdom. All right. These are the people today who are doing the most for God. What people do in prayer, they win souls in prayer. Praying for people, that their minds will be clear, that it will be revealed to them about Jesus Christ, his great love for them, his sacrifice for them. He didn't come here to satisfy himself. Here's the king of the ages who came to be a servant to us and to all and to die in our place. People who pray are winning souls. They're solving problems, praying about problems, and seeing God solve them. People who pray are awakening churches. Hmm. They're supplying both men and, men and money for missions. They're keeping fresh and strong these lives far off in sacrificial service on the foreign field. They're praying for missionaries. People who pray don't just pray for themselves, us four, no more. We go beyond our family. We've got to pray for our family, folks. We do need to go beyond that and get into more, praying for uh, missionaries and so on. Yes. And other people who need prayer, the, 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 the addicted and the lonely and the depressed and the sad and the downhearted and the brokenhearted. And you know, we see them everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so we serve them in prayer. And again, there may be other things from the other outlets of power we talked about, but the prayer is the chief thing, and that's where the battles are won. You know, when David did the slaying thing and Goliath came down, he wasn't dead. You know that, right? That stone knocked him up. He hit right in that space where there was a helmet did not come. So what did David do? He did not have his own sword. He had a sling. He went and he grabbed that great big sword from Goliath's side. And he cut his head off. Sorry. That's sensitive, folks. That's funny. And then he took it to show King Saul. You see, it's him. He's gone. But prayer is like that slingshot. And it goes and it hits its mark. It wins the battle. But then sometimes we got to go in and bring it to a conclusion. Uh, and those are through the other outlets of power also. Okay, so <clears throat> this prayer, people who pray, many of you here, prayer warriors, it is a secret service. Jesus said, yeah, the Pharisees like to stand out on the street corners and they like to be in their robes and they want to like their faces to be unwashed showing that they're fasting. And they like to make long prayers. La, 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 la. And all the common people, as they pass them, are going through the busy streets, they say, that's a holy man. Jesus said, don't do that. No. When you pray, get alone with God, and he who sees you in secret will bless you openly. Yes. So prayer is a secret service. It's not something we brag about. It's not something that we need to talk to everybody about. This is between you and God. You are fighting spiritual battles 
on your knees, whatever position you're taking. Secret service. Can you do that? Can we do that? Okay. Without recognition. You know, like our, our people, they can never, some of those special forces people, you know. You can't tell anybody what you're doing, where you're going. <clears throat> well, anyway, you could be a secret service agent on your knees. God will do as a result of the praying of the humblest one here what otherwise he would not do. Sometimes we wonder if prayer works. Does prayer really change things? And the answer is yes, it does. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide that, now listen to this part of the verse, why we are chosen. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Amen. It doesn't say he shall, it says he may. So the Bible tells us that the eyes of the Lord are continually going to and fro throughout the earth, looking for someone <coughs> who is looking up to him and waiting to receive. So we've got a God willing to give, and it needs another party. It needs a man or woman willing to receive. Let's pray. <clears throat> All right. What else do we have here before we close? Broad God does not crowd or coerce anybody. Everything God does for man and through man, he does with man's consent. Always. Now, if, again, it would be nice. We think if he would just take control of us. If God could sit at our dinner table and say, don't eat that and then take it away from us if we're eating too much. Let's use that as a simple illustration. Or say, when we're driving down the road, you're not turning the car that way, and the steering wheel won't turn for the car. That's not God. God will never take away our, the, the, uh, our ability to choose. Never. That is up to us. But he will help us. He'll give us strength for that. So prayer opens up a whole planet that being stuck in one spot at one time when we pray, we can be all over the world affecting people all over the world. Our prayers for mission field and for missionaries can change uh, how a person is thinking when they're reading a tract that's been passed out to them. And your prayers can affect that he's going to be able to read that and understand and receive. Because this is a spiritual battle we're in, a battle in prayer. That's where we fight the battle. Amen. And that's where they are won. Prayer for a missionary can mean the difference between him or her being sick and, and unable to minister or being able to proclaim the word of God with authority and power and anointing. Paul said, pray for me, that I might be able to say the words boldly when I'm preaching to people. Paul needed prayer, you know, everybody else does. Hold me up in prayer. You can do more than pray after you have prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. We can do no thing of real power until we've done the prayer thing. So intercession is winning the victory over the chief, and service is taking the field after the chief is driven off. All right, so we're going to conclude this little study today. There's one inlet of power, and that's the Holy Spirit. And there are five outlets of power through the life, what we are, through the lips, what we say, through our service, what we do, through our money, what we do not keep, through our prayer, 
what we claim in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. And the greatest outlet is through prayer. Jesus said to pray always and faint not. It should be our goal to make prayer a priority in our lives. The result of prayer is that unbelievers are set free from their unbelief. Our lives are richer, our families more blessed, our church guided and directed by the Holy Spirit, our workplace is more loving, our country and its leaders guided by God. We need to pray for our country, our community, our leaders everywhere. And we want to love that quiet place, that secret place of prayer where we stand as intercessors for the unsaved, the sick, the addicted, the broken, those who've lost their way. And we want to join with God in his rescue plan for the world. So let's just broaden our lives. Enjoy being a Christian. Enjoy the freedom that God has given us. Freedom from sin. Sin gone. The big list of sins throughout our lives wiped out by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross Amen. comes only when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And say, oh, come, Lord, I want to be born again. I want to be a new Christian. Amen. Amen. We are going to sing, I surrender all. <clears throat> and as we sing this song, make it your prayer. Let's stand.
Dave Brass, would you close in prayer, please? Father God, we just we thank you for this wonderful day you have blessed us with, Lord. We thank you for your words this morning to encourage us to dig deeper with you, Lord, to grow closer to you. Father God, may we just take it a challenge this week for each and every one of us to spend more time in prayer and listening to your wisdom, Lord. Father God, we give you the praise and glory. May you bless us as we go out throughout today. Bless all the mothers, Lord, and continue to encourage them and give them strength. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Everybody, if you didn't pick towels, which is all ready, just bring them up here.